Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Um, now I gotta walk down here because since I'll, I have the cooties, so you guys all sat back here. We, you don't know me yet. It's just gonna make me come to you. That's all that happens. It doesn't save you from my presence. Um, so today's town hall uh, is really just about giving a couple of updates and just so you can have an opportunity to ask questions or give feedback or talk about what's going on. Um, because usually I'm rocking and racing, and even in OMM Lab, you guys, if you're in the first group, you're running out. If you're in the second group, you're really running out uh, to ask questions. So going to update on a couple of policies and procedures, some of which came out of the first year class and things that people were asking about. Um, talk about some upcoming changes and highlight some things in the curriculum and the infrastructure and its content. And then just ask you questions and, of course, give you free food. So we already gave you free food, so yay, that one's done. Um, I hope you guys can see this. This is what you get for sitting in the back. But this is our vision and mission. And you'll see me use it on almost every presentation that I do because it's our North Star. If you ever want to know why something's in the curriculum, look to the mission and you can fi probably find a reason as to why we're doing it. When you're looking at your medical scholarship and it says that we want to advance research, when you're looking at your community service learning and leadership course that you're about to do and we say that we want to serve the underserved, and create culturally competent physicians, that's where that comes from. All the things that we do, we spend a lot of time on the new curriculum in particular, and many things that we could implement in the legacy curriculum, we did. So those things exist as well. So just some housekeeping. So my, first of all, God bless the curriculum reps. So can we just give a round of applause? For Wilson, Christina, I don't know if David B, I don't know if the other curriculum reps are here. Um, because they work hard, and I don't know what the other student leaders are doing. I know they're all working hard, but I can vouch for how hard your curriculum reps work. Maybe too hard. So maybe some of you need a therapist, not your curriculum rep, uh, <laughs> to tell things to. But they do bring things to us, and we try to address it uh, as soon as possible. So one thing is, we have a timeline for when we release uh, schedules. So for the spring semester, 145 will be updated November 1st. So I know you guys are looking at last year's schedule, but that is not this year's schedule. Uh, so look for that November 1st. So that has not been finalized. Um, for the legacy curriculum, we keep getting this question about where did my two weeks go? I don't know what this obsession is about these two weeks. Uh, one is, and again, we're voting on this tomorrow at curriculum committee. Part of the timing of when we release information is based on when they're official. <laughs> Uh, so I'll let it out mm, 12 hours early <laughs> or 14 hours early. We'll be voting on this tomorrow at curriculum, which is to update the academic schedule. Uh, one of those weeks went to Christmas break. So for the second year class only, they'll have essentially a three week winter break. Uh, and that'll start, I guess, December 16th or something like that. Uh, I have to double back and look and see when the CTL session is. Uh, that happens for second years. I don't know, Christina, if you know off the top of your head. Uh, that's going to be on the calendar as well. And the other place happens, your spring semester actually ends uh, a week earlier compared to previous years. Last year, this is what we expect to happen. Uh, again, it hasn't been finalized, but just so you can stop harassing your curriculum reps uh, and your class presidents. Um, last year's last class, and again, that's not the term ending, so if you look at the academic calendar, the term ends May 29th, because that includes your study period, but the last class exam, things like that, will end, I believe, roughly around April 17th is what we expect. I cannot give you an official answer until that is finalized, but that is what we expect to have happen. Um, so. For Tensegrity curriculum students, they say, where can I get more practice questions? Um, and I think it's a great question. It didn't occur to us as we were creating this. In second year, as part of your tuition, we buy you uh, a subscription for the year uh, to ComBank. Um, and I spoke to CTL about it, and I said, oh, that is a great point. We didn't budget for it this year. Um, so for students who want to do that, um, the recommendation was actually to use, hold on, let me say it right. Um, Kaplan and I think USMLE only because they're cheaper uh, and one of the things that we've recommended before and this will also happen at the end of your second year in previous years the school bought Kaplan or OMM boot camp or excuse me um, complex boot camp or other things that was mandatory that all students took um, and that was part of that six-week 
study period. After talking to students, uh, some of the feedback we got was other students wanted to use other programs. So we stopped doing that and instead we put it in as a fund so that students could choose what review program they wanted to use. And so how that works is that basically your class president or some other uh, class leader will say, okay, how many people want to do PASS program? How many people want to do uh, ComBank? How many people want to do Kaplan? And basically go to those companies in mass with the number of people who want to do those programs so that you guys can get a group rate. Um, but that is so that you don't have to then spend extra money because that's what was happening. We would buy Kaplan or we would buy whatever program and then half the class or more wanted a different program. So that's why that ended and that's how that's managed now. Um, any questions about that? Um, so to that end, in terms of question, uh, practice questions for the first years, our apologies, we didn't have that foresight, but we will be asking for it in future budgets is to come together. Uh, I would recommend a class leader come together and if, for those who want to get questions this year to go in and decide who you want to do that with or again, just like the second years do, in clumps. This many people want this many subscriptions or this many people want that and go to those companies and get a group rate and Lisa Cardello can help you with contact uh, person to do that. Um, I think I answered all that. We good? Awesome. So here's our organizational charts. These next slides were in your orientation, and yet we are still struggling with some of this. So I point this out so that you can follow the protocols that we have in place for when you have questions or when you have issues. See, if the dean of the school, you have several senior associate deans, and then you have what I call the mini deans, and I'm the only one that likes that, so don't call other deans and academic affairs mini deans. Um, but that includes myself, Dr. Bayshore is here, she's the dean of assessment, uh, Dr. Lambert is dean of uh, student affairs, Dr. Machichi, excuse me, Dean Machichi is uh, alumni affairs and engagement and manages student clubs, uh, and George Scott is clinical ed and Paula Watkins is admissions. Um, and, but I mention that because when you have issues with courses, you guys, some of you, many of you are following what you're supposed to do, and I appreciate that. And I know you are because you're wearing your curriculum reps into the ground. Uh, but some of you are kind of going sort of willy-nilly. So I just want to reiterate, if you have a problem or an issue or a concern about a course, unless it is specific to you, like I did really bad on my histo section, so if it's specific to you, then you want to go directly to the course director. But if it's an issue of, I don't understand what's posted on Blackboard, or I don't know where to go, that's an overall administrative class issue, that should go to the curriculum rep. Why? Because usually seven, eight, or nine, 20 of you will find that, and to keep the course directors from getting 20 emails, we ask you to funnel that through the curriculum rep. And again, obviously, if it's very specific to you, then you would go to the course director. After the course director, excuse me, after the curriculum rec is the course director, uh, and if you are still challenging something, then the chair and then the senior associate dean for academic affairs. Please don't forget the department chair in that process. And if you have a question about who the chair is for that person, uh, we can certainly help you find that out, but it's usually in people's signatures to know who the chair of that department is. If you have a concern about something that affects multiple courses or how they integrate or the sequence or something like that. Again, your first line is still the curriculum rep, but then your next line after that would be me. So if you're not getting your questions answered, and again, I would encourage you and I encourage the curriculum reps to have a time frame. I can get back to you on this issue by X date because sometimes they're dealing with restraints that they have no control over or they're waiting for a meeting to happen or they're waiting for something else and that's not always tomorrow. <laughs> Sometimes it's a couple of weeks or a few weeks away, and sometimes that decision isn't made till a much later date, and they don't have any control over getting you an answer sooner. So, a couple of things on updated policies and procedures. Excused absences, this is for all four years, I think we're live streaming, for anybody who wants to know, come through me. So previously they went through Jackie Jacoby, many of you default to thinking your course director, you should certainly CC your course director, but they come through us, we manage those centrally. Why? Because we want to know if anybody is consistently not making mandatory sessions. We want to know if somebody's consistently asking for postponements of IQs or exams or other things. So that's why that's managed centrally. So please send that through. When you send it, who are you? What year are you? Are you traditional? Are you PVL? <laughs> what date, what time, what event? 
Why are you missing and is there a documentation? I have gotten so many emails like, hey, that's Chanel, this is Bobby, and I'm gonna miss class on Tuesday. Is that okay? What year are you? <laughs> what class is this? What mandatory session? Why are you missing it? It saves us a lot of back and forth if you'll just kindly put that information in so that we can make a decision as promptly uh, as possible. And then recognizing that if you are not excused uh, or if you exceed the numbers that we're gonna talk about, that would be a zero. Uh, and if you get a zero on something, you may fail a course depending on how close you were or how big that thing is that you missed. So that becomes super important. So uh, the things that you are mandatory and often uh, come up are case-based learning, illumination quizzes, and TBL. For each of those subsets, you can miss one a year across all courses, which is, again is why we manage those centrally, <laughs> to know if you've missed them. Um, there aren't that many uh, uh, TBLs. Uh, IQs, again, we want to make sure that you're doing that. The, the likelihood that something always happens on Friday at 9.30 a.m. is, is unlikely. Um, and same thing for TBLs. There's maybe a baker's dozen of those across the, the, the year, across all courses. Um, for other in-class activities like flip classrooms, all these sort of tchotchke small activities, we, you still have to request an excused absence. For all of these, you have to get your request in within a week of uh, the event. So you can't wait to realize that you're gonna fail the course at the end of the semester and then ask to come back. So you have to ask for your excused absence within a week. So even if it's the best reason in the world, if we didn't get that request in within a week, it becomes a zero. So you have to get that in, but for all these other things, we'll put a pin in it, meaning we will look at a remediation activity for you if it's the difference between you passing and failing. Because we don't have honors, high pass, pass, et cetera, it's never gonna make a difference if someone's teetering you know, between different levels. So only if it makes a difference, and hopefully it will not, because these things aren't often worth a whole lot, only if it makes a difference between you passing and failing will we look at that and look at having a remediation activity? I think I caught everything on that slide. Uh, missed exams. We take missing exams very seriously. <laughs> uh, we take moving exams very seriously. Why? Because the structure helps us maintain the integrity of the exam, and it helps us get strengths and opportunities reports out to you, it helps us do post-exam analyses, it helps us do reviews, helps us do all those things. So we take it very seriously. We probably spend between 12 and 20 hours for every exam you take, that's how long it takes a, fac a, a committee of faculty to create an exam. So it's not a small thing. Uh, if you miss an exam, so things that people miss exams for are illness. You gotta be really sick to miss an exam. And we're gonna need documentation that says, that, that says explicitly you were too ill to take the exam. <laughs> and it can't come from your mom or your dad or your aunt or your cousin, okay? Um, if you're missing it for a conference or things like that, again, that should be asked for in advance and you should be asking for permission before you buy a ticket. We don't care if you bought a ticket before you got permission, that's not our problem. Uh, it's never too soon to ask for permission if you're trying to go to a conference or something along those lines. And we have a standard time for makeup exams, which is five o'clock on Monday uh, following a Friday exam or five o'clock on Thursday for uh, a Monday exam. And then I just have a couple more things and then you guys can, Come on me with questions. Uh, so just highlights, and some of this is really more for people in the legacy curriculum who may not be aware of this. One is that we hired an ultrasound instructor, yay, Kate Dealing, and she has 25 years experience as an ultrasonographer uh, out in practice uh, clinically and training ultrasonographers. Uh, uh, so she's here part time. We hope to eventually bring her to full time uh, to do training in uh, the pre-clerkship years, and we hope to eventually bring that to clerkship years. Um, Dr. Jill Baker is our medical scholarship director. Uh, first years are in their medical scholarship intensive week, which we're very excited about. And community service learning and leadership, uh, which is out of the Department of Family Medicine, is Dr. Birch. And we expect to hire two phase directors. One will be starting in October and the other in November, December. Uh, and lastly, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Rosen is resigning as of November 1st. Uh, we wish him well, he's gonna go practice law and we are currently in search for his uh, replacement, though obviously you can never replace Dr. Rosen. 
So, POCUS, point of care ultrasound. Not hocus pocus, but ultrasound. Uh, in the legacy curriculum, we have a lot of people just itching, itching, itching to use our ultrasound machines. It's about a million dollars worth of machines that we have there, so we are very protective of them. Uh, they can only be used in the OMM lab. We're working on workshops, and we've actually had a couple of small beta tests for the uh, Tensegrity curriculum with uh, legacy students, but we do plan on creating a short series for students in their second, third, and fourth year to participate so they can get their hands on uh, for ultrasound machines and do those on nights and weekends. So we're working with Kate Dealing to do that, and we're very excited. Uh, and obviously in the consecutive curriculum, PBL has already started doing ultrasound, and traditional track will start in de December. For medical scholarship, this is a new longitudinal curriculum that runs the four years. People in the uh, current first year class have a capstone project as a graduation requirement. Uh, and so this is a longitudinal curriculum across the four years. Eventually our goal is for uh, Dr. Baker to be a clearing house, to be recruiting and getting information about research opportunities to help connect you out on campus and outside of campus. Uh, in the immediate future, uh, uh, she started the medical scholarship curriculum this week with first years and the medical scholarship intensive week. I've been getting good feedback so far on that. I do want to let you know, so to what we were talking about earlier in the board studying period. As I said, previously we had this structured course that was listed and students had to participate in. When we took that out, we have to make sure we're in compliance. We have to have something in that time period so that you can be a registered student. Uh, and so we tried to think about what we could put in that time period to allow you to be a registered student and that would not be too intrusive. Uh, and what we've come up is basically a review course on epidemiology and biostatistics. It is all, re all review, there is not new information, except if we think there was gaps in the legacy curriculum. Uh, it is all self-paced online. <laughs> uh, that is what we are designing as uh, echoes uh, with some practice questions and then an exam at the end. The end. Uh, that'll be voted on tomorrow. We expect that to go through, but it's so that we can be in compliance with the federal government uh, and keep you guys as registered students. Uh, so, here's my spiel. Use your curriculum reps, use your course directors, follow the hierarchy, don't go over people's heads, it really pisses them off, uh, and it really wears people out. Use your excused absences wisely, um, and keep an eye out for emails on ultrasound activities and other things that you're interested in. The end. So, questions. Uh, I guess I'm doing this. Hold on. Oops. Ooh. I don't know what just happened. Hey. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate a little bit on the... When you speak, can you say what your name is yes. and then year and... Julia class? Scali, class of 2022. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the new multiple choice exam and the two-week biostats class that you brought up? It's not two weeks. It's about a half a dozen hours okay. <laughs> uh, online. So if you decide to use a Saturday and knock it out on a Saturday, you can knock it out on a Saturday. Uh, it'll be about 70 questions, give or take, around biostats, things that you would have to study anyway for complex. Okay. So that's just, it's not like a, it, there are not like certain things that we have to do. You just have to take a multiple choice exam. There's, it's during dedicated time though, correct? It's during dedicated time. Okay. There's going to be online content like lecture-based echoes. Mm -hmm so that you can do it from your house or wherever you don't have to show up to campus. Uh, and the assessment for the course will be the multiple choice exam. That we have to come in for or that's nope. done at home? online. Okay, perfect. Okay. I, can I have a follow-up question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so you spoke about the uh, last block, the last exam, the last class or block exam that we would have would be April 17th. That's what we at expect. At the moment. Yes. Um, and Right now, there says there's a final exam on 145. I'm not sure if we should be following that whatsoever. You should not, not be looking at, at 145 for the spring. Okay. The last block exam that last year had was April. Well, theirs was April 17th, and ours says it's April 15th. Is that? That's not accurate if that's what's there, because I think it was the 20th. It was April, April, April 24th was the on-doc exam, and then the last block exam was April 17th for you guys. Yeah, PBL. Yeah, so I was just I was just wondering if theirs was April seventeenth. Is ours? I don't have that information. All I can tell you is we looked at the last exams for both of that, like 
we just looked at the last exam for both of them. They okay. could have been swapped. I don't know the details of that, but that's where your week is. Okay. So even though ours right now says April 27th for that last final exam, that is going to be moved up a week? What I'm telling you is the schedule on 145 is not something for you to look at. Okay. We're going to do the finalization on November 1st is when it will be posted. Okay. And currently, we expect that to be April 17th. For everything? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Wilson. My name is Wilson, class of 2023. Um, I know during the meeting... Traditional, PBL? Uh, traditional. Um, so during the curriculum meeting, they mentioned the biostats and epidemiology class. Is, does that... Uh, is it going to apply to us as well? It'll apply well? for all classes okay, I just ongoing want to make sure. okay. in perpetuity Okay. for the same reasons. Okay. I mean, so we're going to do it in the spring, right, in April? At the end of your second year. Oh, so just the second year, okay. Yeah, it's for the second year at the end of second year during your dedicated time. Okay, so in the class. Thank you. Yes. Um, Chloe Shermick in class with 2023 traditional. So if we buy like board prep things, so if we buy like UWorld on our own right now, would the school reimburse us or would we have to wait to coordinate with our current class? So the school won't reimburse you. It's not in our budget. Okay. We just didn't think of it until okay. students uh, raised the issue, which we think is valid. And we'll certainly be asking for it in future budgets. Okay. Uh, and so now it would be on your own to do that. And I'm suggesting to you that you do it as a group. Uh, because then you can go to different companies and get a group rate rather than as an individual. And then are there, I know that there are some second years that are like representatives for like Kaplan. Are there, do we know if there are, is there a way for us to figure out who are the representatives for each thing within our school? So once you figure out who your point person is that's going to represent you as a class uh, or who those leaders are, which I suggest that you figure that out in mass, you shouldn't have one person over here getting their five friends together and another person over here getting their five friends together. You should come together and be 10 people. Um, once you figure out who those reps are going to be, it's often the class president or class rep, um, then they can coordinate with Lisa Cardello and she could, tell, could connect you with the different reps from the different companies. So would one person have to contact a company, say, I want to be the rep from my institution, and then you now... You, just, you decide amongst yourselves and you're the rep. Okay. Because you're representing however many students want to go in together. It's just like if you do a group trip and you call the airline or you call the theater, you're just coming in and saying, I have this many students who want to buy this product. You know, this is the individual rate. What's the best rate you can give us? Other questions? Yes. Uh, Christine DePope, class of 2022. Uh, I know that currently we have two uh, curriculum reps, one for traditional, one for PBL. Um, the traditional class is 150 students typically, and the PBL class is about uh, 50. So I know that they work very hard. I personally think they're overworked. Has there ever been any consideration for adding a second uh, curriculum rep for the traditional class? Uh, nope. Would there ever be? I can't imagine why we would do that. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, <laughs> I think that's something for your class to sit down and have a conversation about if you feel like you need more than one rep. I would be extraordinarily concerned about having two different places to go to and we really try very hard to make sure that we don't message different things from different places the more people you have involved the more likely that you're going to have conflicting information or limited information or different people coming and saying different things and so that that would be my biggest concern now you guys can talk about it as a class um, and we can certainly take it up it's not we're actually changing our bylaws in terms of how we move forward. In our bylaws, it wouldn't be an official recognition of more than one rep uh, per track. Um, but those are things, that's why I would be very concerned about having more than one rep, because it just creates more chaos about who's doing what. Um, that's why we have one per class and one per track, because we recognize class to class has different issues, and we recognize PBL to traditional have different issues. So that's already uh, quite a lot of student representation. Other questions? Yeah. You pass this over. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Chanel. Uh, first, thank you for holding this town hall meeting. Uh, I know you didn't have to do this, so uh, we're, 
we're really grateful to have a concerned and engaged team of professionals here at the helm of the school. Uh, within the coming week. Uh, Stop. Name. St uh, sorry, Stephen Poos, class of 2023. Very sorry. Traditional. Cl traditional, traditional, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Within the coming week, I plan on passing along a letter to the administration through my class's curriculum representative. Uh, out of respect for other students who might have other comments on the curriculum, I will not relate the full contents of that letter in detail here, but in brief, I can tell you that my letter discusses three potential areas of improvement within the curriculum. Improving the quality of instruction of the OMM lab, overcoming logistical and organizational challenges in the osteopathic clinical skills course, and increasing the efficiency of the use of time in the anatomy lab. Uh, I also included proposed solutions for achieving these goals. Uh, while the views ex expressed in the letter are explicitly my own, I do not claim to speak for any of my classmates. Uh, I will say that I have allowed my classmates to see my letter, and many of them agreed with at least some of the points that I made within. Uh, I would again like to thank the faculty and staff uh, for their continued commitment to our education, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So one of the things I'll say is if you have a specific issue about OMM, that should go to the course director, uh, I mean curriculum rep, and then to the course director. So the curriculum rep can take that to the course director. Um, but you want to have that conversation because oftentimes, especially if it's just you who's, who's writing it, some of those issues have already been taken up and, and brought over. Um, and then what I'll say is, first of all, thanks for being engaged because we are, in fact, always trying to make the curriculum and to make the school run better. Um, we don't know each other yet, but I take your time very seriously. Uh, and I don't ever want to waste your time, and I want things to run as well as possible. I think that you're entitled to that on our end. Um, that being said, I hope that your letter gets specific, because <laughs> one of the challenges, huh? Okay, so your first year, you were in the writing class today about emails and conciseness. I hope you go back and revisit that. <laughs> That's where, I'm where that came from. Uh, we just were doing interviews and I had someone interviewing for something and they gave me a five page cover letter. Whoosh. I'm not thinking, you don't know how to be concise. I don't have time, I take your time seriously, I take my time seriously. I don't have time for it. So one of the challenges I will say is I wanna hear you, but I'm gonna beg you to be concise and get to the point. I haven't seen your letter, I don't know if it's long or not, but this is a broad statement <laughs> across the board. Get to the point. Be concise, bullet points are great, <laughs> awesome. But in the context of a 10-page letter, I'm not sure. So <laughs> the context matters. So uh, we wanna hear the feedback, but when people say things like, we never know where to go, that can't possibly be true. The curriculum, uh, the first years are in the auditorium, second years, are, like you can't possibly never know where to go. So when people make broad sweeping statements, it's really hard to fix that. When they say Blackboard is not organized and things, I don't know where the folders are or the PowerPoints weren't posted, you know, or were posted late in histology or in OMM, now I know who to go to and say this is a specific issue that I can address. Or they say no one at Rowan cares, that's my favorite, which is really hurtful because you have no idea the dedication of most of your faculty, if not all of your faculty. And in the ones that I can say, I say most because some people have personal issues that uh, take up some of their time. Uh, but your faculty in the school cares tremendously about you, so it's really hurtful actually when students write things in their course evaluations and say no one at Rowan cares. It's just not accurate. But this is a two-way street, which is stop, pause, think, reflect. What exactly am I complaining about? And what exactly do I wanna see done about it? And you don't always know what you want done about it, but you sometimes have some idea. Because you may not like my solution. <laughs> if you tell me what the problem is and you don't come with a solution, I'll be like, oh, you don't like the food in the cafeteria. No problem, no more cafeteria. That's not what we want it. Like, <laughs> but you didn't give me a suggestion. <laughs> you didn't say I want more vegan options or more gluten-free options, though I heard you guys got that, so good for you. But you didn't get specific. So you might not like my solution, so it's really helpful if you get really specific about not just the cafeteria is awful, but the cafeteria doesn't have vegan options, or the cafeteria doesn't have gluten-free options. Can we have those, please, for all three meals? That's specific, 
and now that's something that I can dress versus the cafeteria is awful. I mean, I can't do that one, but you understand what I'm saying in the curriculum of, you know, things are disorganized. There's actually quite a lot of organization and we spend quite a lot of time trying to make things organized. So the more specific you get, the better and more likely it is that you'll get the outcome you want. And I, I desperately want you to have that outcome. But it's just exhausting when people speak in blanket terms or in vagueness that I can't get to. If someone just says, you need to read more. While that may be true, it's not particularly helpful to you as a student if somebody makes a blanket statement like that to you. And it's the same thing for us as administrators. So looking forward to your letter. Uh, have fun with that. Uh, and I, like I said, keep in mind the training you had today on writing or yesterday, uh, and please feel free to go back and review it before you submit it. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, I'm gonna get my steps in today. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, hi, um, I'm Caitlin McGowan. I'm year one uh, traditional. <laughs> and I just have a couple, like, just small things about anatomy that I also put on my course about. Um, so first off, like, I learned a lot. It was a great course. Dr. White is awesome. But in the lab, they definitely could have used more instructors because like on certain days, our TAs who are mostly second years, you guys are great, but sometimes they would have say an exam or like an OMM assessment and they wouldn't be there and we just wouldn't have enough people helping us. It would just be maybe sometimes like three or four instructors going around a room of like 140 people and it just wasn't enough. So. My group would kind of wait around for instruction and then we'd kind of be blindly cutting, which we really mm -hmm. don't like doing. Uh -huh. But um, we just needed a little more instruction. Yeah. Um, so I'll field the anatomy Sure, one. sure. I'm not the anatomy, I know Dr. White. Yeah. I'm histo and I'm gonna tell you, yeah. we recruit everywhere, anywhere, all the time. They are not training anatomists, they are not training histologists. Yeah. We literally hire and train, we go everywhere we can. What we've got yeah. is what we've got and we do everything. If we yeah. don't have enough, it's literally because we cannot find the bodies with the expertise. And rather than put somebody that would yeah. hurt your education in there, <laughs> we're working shorthanded. So I just more, want you to know that yeah. though we do the, do the best we can to meet your needs, you have to know that we are also limited by certain resources. We're actually thinking about starting a program to train anatomists so they can go to not only our school, but other schools, but then the number of people that apply to it. So there, there are mitigating factors just beyond wanting to meet your needs that are just societal that so no we know that that's an issue know that we're working on it no we have been working on it for mm -hmm. five years and what we have now is actually better than what we had four years ago yeah. but we recognize it's still not as good that doesn't mean we'll be able to get more in okay by next year I just want you to know that nationally that yeah. that is nationally it's an issue you mm -hmm. just have to know yeah. That. And so we're doing the best we can and thinking of as many creative means to do that, but we're not willing to put somebody in there that doesn't have the expertise yeah. because we think that would be more hurtful. Okay. I think she had a follow-up Yeah, I do have a couple, I just like a couple more was quick it, things. Was it related um, to that question? It was, uh, I'll, I, I promise you. Yes, go ahead, go for it. She says it's related, so let's see what she does. Um, I similarly, my name's Marielle. I'm also a first year traditional student. Um, I had a similar experience as Katie and I was thinking, would it be possible to maybe divide up our sections so that there's just less bodies in the room at one time so that we could get... The amount of time and somebody like me has right. to be there and they just aren't that many hours in the day. Like I get that. The minute I can clone myself or be in two places at one time, I will do it and win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so one of the challenges um, that we look at, so she's speaking specifically about histology. I can certainly take it to anatomy. Uh, Y'all heard it, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I worry sometimes. I can certainly take it to the anatomy department, but that is one of the challenges is um, faculty, all of your basic science faculty teach not only for SOM, but also teach for GSBS, uh, and some teach at the other schools as well. And so just based on the number of hours a day and the number of commitments that they have across the two schools, um, sometimes that's a challenge uh, to break the class up. Um, but trust me, um, I'm happy to look at that and take that back again, but that is one of the challenges that we have uh, specifically with basic scientists, uh, is that they are teaching in multiple schools here. 
Yes. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense, like the faculty shortage, like I get that. Um, but then I have to say like the second years who helped in the lab, like they were fantastic. So I don't know if there's a way to recruit more of them to be in there on days when possible or even um, third I'm years. I'm happy like, to relay anybody. that. I know that as Dr. Yeah. Fisher said, that was one of the solves yeah. is because we can't find qualified people. They're just, there's just a shortage in yeah. that regard. Uh, so I'm happy to relay that uh, and convey that yeah, even more. Yep, that would be awesome. Uh -huh. And then my only other thing with anatomy was just like, I noticed, I don't know if it was just for this year with the new curriculum, but sometimes like we'd learn something in lecture in the morning and then dissect it in the afternoon, or we'd dissect something that we hadn't learned about yet. Um, so I don't know if they could just better kind of like coordinate like the lecture with the dissection? So in terms of staggering things, one of the challenges, was that the last one? Because I want to take my mic back. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is that you have other commitments. And I can't tell you the number of hours that we spent. Christina, would you like to tell them the number of hours we spent? I can't tell you. Christina Spalletti is the third, third year rep, and she was one of the reps who was faithfully present in the renewal process over the last couple years. Uh, God bless her every day. Um, but one of the challenges is that you have other commitments and in order to get the staggering that you want i mean i will i i can't imagine why you're dissecting something before you've learned about it except ex okay i'm not saying it didn't um, uh, one is write those down um and then pass those on to wilson because they can look at those individually and say is this something that we can have control over and move some things around but sometimes it's just a limit on the number of hours in a day so you guys have OMM on Wednesday mornings, on doc on Tuesday afternoons, when, or, or not on doc, H&P uh, on Tuesday afternoons. Uh, going forward, you'll have, well, it doesn't apply to anatomy, but those are the two big ones. In order, and, and even with us trying to keep the hours down per week, um, in order to not elongate the entire curriculum because we don't have Wednesday exams and we can't have Wednesday exams because that would mean every three to four weeks we'd be canceling your H&P class. We can't have Thursday exams because it means your study day would fall on Wednesday and every three or four weeks we'd be canceling OMM. And your faculty who teach in those classes are clinicians and they have office hours and other obligations <laughs> to do other things and are often preceptors and are teaching in the residencies. So it becomes Jenga in terms of trying to find times and fit things in. So that's why 90% of your exams are on Friday. We want you to have green weekends, but it's also because that's a time when we don't have any other revolving commitments that involve people with other classes. I can make sure that there are no lectures on Thursday, but I can't bump family medicine or OMM faculty every three weeks to give you a study day. And if I stagger things the way you're talking about, it would elongate, it would necessarily elongate the blocks in order even 24 hours of lag time that you're talking about would either mean that you didn't have a full study day or that you always have Monday exams or <laughs> you understand like there's a cascade effect um, that happens when we're trying to mix things in, these things up uh, and there are other goals that we have so certainly like I said the idea that you're dissecting things and you haven't looked at, please send that list because I really want to look at that. But we do actually try to stagger material in that way and when we don't, it's literally because of the consequences are too great. The risk versus benefit is too great for the longevity of, of the curriculum and other things that you want to have. Okay, but we are thinking about it, I swear. Yes, Christina. So I really want to encourage you to submit that because that's a really good point. You shouldn't, but sometimes, what happens is we'd be in the meeting and we'd have like a, 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 a problem we had to solve. And then the student reps and the administrators and Dr. White and everyone, we would try to come up with the best solution. And often that meant like going back and polling the class and saying, what would you have preferred if you were, you were a first year again? And sometimes the answer we came up with as students to encourage 
might not have been what your class liked or what your class would have preferred because we didn't meet you yet, we didn't know your learning styles yet and all of those things about being a new class and being in a new curriculum. So I think it's really important to write down when things like that happen in your evaluations because those get read with a fine tooth comb and if you can pinpoint, okay, this is where it happened in the schedule, we need to correct this. Unfortunately, it won't be corrected for you at this time, but it'll be corrected for every class under you and if you ever have a similar situation moving forward. So I think it's really important to mark when those specific things happen and let your reps and your course directors know as they're happening and in the eval so that they can be corrected as soon as possible. Because sometimes it's just the thing where there was a 50-50 chance that this might have been the better option, but when it played out, maybe B instead of A would have been better. And it's good to hear that. So I think that's the fastest way those things can get solved. And that is on you to let the administration and the course directors know when they come up. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Vinny Parekh, first year uh, traditional student. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that happened last week with the OMM practical. Um, it was like something that I think a lot of my classmates felt um, a little bit, I guess, frustrated about, which was the fact that uh, an extra technique was added the night before the exam around like 7 p.m. Um, with the exam being on Friday and the practical being, I believe, on Wednesday. Um, obviously, I know that uh, we need to be able to do all the different techniques, and so like adding another technique may not be like unreasonable, but at the same time, it was the night before. So I think a lot of my classmates would like to know why it was added and uh, understand like your perspective or the faculty's perspective for that reason. Sure. So um, thank you. So I agree with you in terms of timing, and I press all faculty to give notice. So I apologize that you weren't given what I would have considered to be proper notice. That's the only way I can say that. Uh, did you clap? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm like, wow, you really feel some kind of way. Um, that being said, I, the rationale behind it was uh, one of the things that we wanted to do in the new curriculum was to have more opportunities to demonstrate techniques. Uh, and going forward, we don't expect that to happen. So I apologize for this uh, event, but the rationale was to test students on more techniques to make you more proficient. Um, I have to tell you, long term, I have visions of students doing OMM out in the community and being way more engaged than we currently are. Um, and over the last 10, 15 years, the amount that we test and engage you with SPs and put you in environments is uh, vastly improved. Um, but part of that is you practicing and being accountable. So again, I apologize for the short notice and we'll avoid that uh, going forward, but the rationale is to get you to practice more and to see your proficiency uh, and have more touch points on that so that when we say you're proficient, we know you're proficient. Yes. Hi again, I'm Marielle, first year traditional student. Um, I just had a quick question for you as far as um, our ranking goes. I've heard a lot of mixed things with this new curriculum. Some people are under the impression that we're being ranked but not being told we're being ranked for our first and second year, and I just wanted to hear it from, from the official. Me, sure. Um, so we have never um, ranked students in the past. Um, when I went to PCOM, and you got your, your number 175 out of 258, like you were ranked verbatim per person. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about ranking. We spent a lot of time going back and forth about pass-fail. Um, and a lot of students and student leaders, and I mean, not just like Christina, like a, like a bunch, were brought in to specifically talk about ranking and to specifically talk about pass-fail. Uh, and the conclusion that student leadership came to was gunners are gonna be gunners, and it doesn't matter if you're gonna give them honors or high pass or pass, they want that 95, because they want that 95, because yes. Uh, and then the people who don't care, <laughs> don't care. <laughs> and they would have just fallen where they fell anyway and just happy to get through. <laughs> You're like pointing. <laughs> <laughs> Takes all kinds to make the world go around, right? So um, that's part of the reason that we went to pass fail, but we thought it would take off a lot of the angst and anxiety that it provokes for some students, especially when they're like, but I have an 89.43, and if you would just reconsider this one question, I would have an honors and all that kind of stuff. Um, that being said, 
We also look very strongly about how everything that we do here affects you in your residency competitiveness. And residencies want to know where you rank within your class. Um, and so what we came up with was for a number of reasons. So one is our course is pass fail. Our courses, our curriculum is pass fail. That obviously does not mean that we are not measuring how you're performing by percentages. We are. And we have a dashboard with all of your information. And that has been created <laughs> uh, by the assessment team in the last several years and built in-house, et cetera. Uh, our ultimate goal would be hopefully to give students access to that. It's a licensing issue and a cost issue and a whole bunch of other stuff. But certainly in the near future and certainly for your class and going forward to have episodic touch points to look at your whole dashboard with you. You guys don't really need our dashboard because you already have all your numbers. If you wanted to create your own dashboard, you could. No one is going, where do you fall compared to her, compared to him? What we're looking at when we look at those numbers are predicting how you will do on boards and are you in danger? And predicting so that we can give you better feedback earlier on about where you fall on the spectrum of competitiveness so that you can gear <laughs> your decisions about what specialties you want to go into and what you need to build your application process up better. So particularly, and again, this was driven by looking at GME and what GME residencies care about. So are we clear that in first and second year, no, and, and across your curriculum, no one is going you versus you versus you. That's not happening. Though we do know what your percentage averages is on courses and your overall average, and we know what yours is, and we know what yours is by percentages to several decimal places, okay? In clerkships, the other issue is if I have to rank you, I have to be sure that I'm comparing apples to oranges. How do I compare PBL ranking on a different set of exams to traditional rankings on a different set of exams? Which is why we do rank you based on your clerkship years in quintiles. It's only for third and fourth year. It doesn't address first and second year. The reason that happened is because we have to be able to say it's fair, PBL to traditional, and quite frankly, residencies say time and again, they do not care about pass-fail or what your percentage is in pre-clerkship. They just don't care. They care in clerkships, which is why you still have honors high pass, pass and fail. That's on purpose, and that's looking at what residencies care about. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Everybody feel clear about that? You feel good? Okay. So we are always looking at, did you want to bet? We are always, I see, I'm a mom, I see everything. We are always looking at what's our end goal. Our end goal is to make you the best version of you and make you the most competitive you can be to have the career that you want. So we talked to our hospital and residency partners and asked them when we were doing the curriculum, we invited them to the table and we said, who do you want in your residencies? What skills do you want? That's why you have a medical scholarship curriculum. That's why you have health system science in your curriculum. Those things directly came from residency saying, please put this in your curriculum and train your students in these areas. Okay, so I hope I answered those. So ranking is in quintiles, it's based on clerkships. Okay, but that doesn't mean we're not tracking you with numbers. Okay, thank you. Can you pass that over? I'm just so lazy. Hi, Stephen Poos, class 2023 traditional. Um, is there any reason why OMM questions get included in the anatomy block uh, exam and in the anatomy block grades instead of in the OCS course? Yes. So you're really talking really close. So the question is why are OMM questions in your block exams and not in OCS? Uh, and that went back and forth, <laughs> I swear to God. So many conversations, so many meetings. Um, and, <laughs> and I'm an introvert, I don't like people like this. So, um, Comlex is an integrated exam. That's the number one reason, is for you to get used to seeing questions in an integrated way. We want you to have that practice of seeing that. So it also helps us with better prediction so that you can see how you're doing along the way as you're going through. So previously, when OMM was separate and ONDOC was separate, you had a midterm and you had a final per semester. So you had four exams for OMM the whole year. So now you're getting clusters of questions, more frequent testing to get you used to that style. And Dr. Cooley actually chairs the MBOME COMAT committee 
that writes the OMM COMAT. <laughs> so the idea was get you more and more frequent practice and to have it integrated because that is what Comlex is like. It integrates OMM. That's why that happens that way. And then we took, for the most part, I mean, there's a couple of questions, TBLs, things to sprinkle in, <coughs> all of your clinical skills, again, to make it cleaner so that when you're going to take, and I hope you all know this, there, to graduate from medical school in your fourth year, you'll take the Comlex PE, which is a national exam where you have to go through a series of standardized patients and OSCEs in uh, uh, patient scenarios. And we have internal benchmarks before we let you get to that. We're hoping that separating that out makes it cleaner for us to predict how you're doing along the, the, along the way to catch you way before you get to third and fourth year. So we have, in the legacy curriculum, we have something called the CSCE, which is the clinical skills and clinical evaluation, or I forget what the second C is. Um, <laughs> that you have to take internally before we give you permission to take the external exam, because failing that exam is a kiss of death when it comes to residencies. In the new curriculum, we actually have a mini version of that at the end of second year to catch you even sooner. And all the benchmarks and HPs and things that we're doing, and all the things that Dr. Brolis is working on, is to restructure how we do all of our SPs to find students faster and shore up their weak areas faster, better, stronger, faster along the way. So I hope I answered your Question. Sure. That's that. Okay, so uh, we, we talked about why they're tested together, uh, but why don't you uh, break out the grades then? Why, why do the uh, OMM questions get factored into the grades for anatomy? Sort of what I meant. Why because don't you break it's it out? still considered part of anatomy. So, particularly, I mean, honestly, particularly for anatomy, one of the reasons, uh, and you can thank me or hate me for it. As someone who has taught anatomy, excuse me, taught OMM for the last decade and a half here, I front-loaded anatomy because it makes my job as an OMM professor easier when you've had it ahead of time. And you can ask, Christina, you want to vouch for me on this, having anatomy beforehand? Uh, uh, it's so confusing when you don't know where the muscles are and OMM, like, So particularly in anatomy, but as you go along, the techniques that you learn are directed towards the systems that you're in. So you'll be learning lymphatic techniques around the gut when you're in GI uh, or when you're in respiratory. You'll be learning uh, when you're in neuromuscular, when you're in brain and behavior that has neuromusculoskeletal, you'll be learning upper extremities and things that have to do with nerve impingement. So you're an osteopathic physician. We want you to see the clinical correlations at the time that you're doing them. It's all one. That's, that's our goal for you as an osteopathic student and an osteopathic physician. Thank you. I'm going to leave the mic with you until you tell me you're done. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a response to, like, in the, to what you said about, like, the blocks going together. What, what goes together with biochemistry for OMF? What goes together with biochemistry? Yeah, because you, yes, you were talking about, like, how, like, you know, got OMM goes together with GI and what, what goes together with biochemistry. You're asking, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So whenever Sorry. you're talking about organ systems, viscera, organs, lymphatics, et cetera, all of that is related to biochemistry. And a lot of that has to do with mobilization, so that's still connected. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. So on your, huh? Okay. On strengths and opportunities, um, but your biomedical block is biochemistry, immuno, and pathology, fundamentals. Um, so those are still uh, present as well. And we've synchronized those as, are you done? Because they gave it back, but I wasn't sure. Uh, I'll give it back if you need it. Um, listen, I'm going to tell you right now. We've synchronized those as best we can, and when you see them not synchronized, it's just because there's not room. It's not possible to perfectly synchronize it based on how many techniques you can do in a lab at a time, how much you can process, and just how many weeks are in a block. So sometimes you're like, why is this here? Because that's where that's, that's, you know, <laughs> that's where we could fit it in, and that's where it best worked based on time constraints. Thank you. Okay. Julius Colley, class of 2022. Um, I know that November 1st will be when the whole begin the you got plans. second semester. Something else we yes. talk about. <laughs> What's the plan? Board studying and vacations and stuff. But okay. this is, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking oh, about right. December winter break. I was just wondering when we will find out 
when that will be finalized. I know it that's starts December tomorrow. 14th. That's oh, the, it's that's finalized, finalized tomorrow. tomorrow. We have a curriculum committee meeting tomorrow. Okay, so of those will we find out what's scheduled during those times as well? Because I know other people, right now they're set as study days, so some people. Right, so um, I just have to, Farron, do you guys, when is the second year, oh, thank God that you're here. When is the second year um, pre-clinical, don't you guys do that in the winter break for second years or is that third years that I'm thinking about? I think I'm thinking about third years into fourth years. You guys do that over the Monday of winter break? So the second years is a wrap. Awesome, good, I'm glad I can answer that. Doesn't apply to you. What I was, what I was thinking of doesn't apply to you. Um, that'll be post, I mean, we can post that and send that out officially uh, tomorrow. So the, the thing I'm thinking about applies to third year, which is the Monday. The 16th applies to third years, and I'm just getting my uh, classes confused. Uh, for second years, it's just vacation. So who should not make plans? If you fail something, the remediation period is over that break. So if you got plane tickets, and you fail anatomy, or you fail biomedical foundations, or you fail room and derm, I don't care that you have a plane ticket. That's when the remediation exam is. So that's the only issue or question. So right now it's December 10th is our last exam, uh -huh. and it goes until December. I was just wondering of like 11th, 12th, 13th, are we gonna have classes? Are we gonna have something scheduled? I gotta look at a calendar. You clearly have studied this way I more than me. <laughs> um, you just have so much free time. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of time. 11, 12, like I have to look at the calendar. I don't know what's scheduled currently during that time period. As far as I know, uh, there's class during that time, but I don't remember. I don't have the schedule memorized. Okay. Did you want to end your calendar session to David and I so that at curriculum meeting tomorrow we can make sure that we have and like have a record before we go on Sunday? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're doing Sunday? Yeah. Oh, I'm LBS. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not So I assume you have class between the 10th and the 13th scheduled. So we don't have any intention to fill them. Okay. We reserve the right to fill them, but we don't generally do things like that. So the reason that we post the calendar when we post it is so that students can make their plans uh, accordingly. So unless something significant happened, we wouldn't schedule something that isn't on the calendar. So let's say there was a hurricane, like this comes up really more in the winter in February. There's a snow day. <laughs> And there wasn't anything scheduled, but we got to find a time to make up all the content that was lost on the snow day. Then we reserve the right to put things there because something external happened. That's the only time things like that happen, and we'd take it on a case-by-case -case basis if we didn't have something scheduled and someone said I had a flight out because nothing was scheduled. Why don't you and I talk offline? You tell me what you're trying to do so we can stop having this conversation. And like, like seriously, because there's something that you're trying to get at, and if I, and if, and if I, if I knew what that was, then I could help solve it. Um, yes. Maritza Gover, first year. What else? The, my, oh, traditional. So um, my question is regarding um, going back to OMM. Um, I've been at every anatomy review. I just think that kind of get what you put into it. Um, the reviews in themselves have been really helpful. Um, can we expect to see a faculty member or somehow for us to specifically ask our OMM questions? Because I know we're not allowed to bring any writing utensils, so we kind of have to mentally make note of you know, if there's the repetitive concept we're missing or that was not all clear to us. So is, can we expect a faculty member to be there along with whatever block we're in, whether it's histo, mm -hmm. et cetera? So I can try and bring that back to uh, Dr. Bailey. I, I'm sorry, I can't keep track of who's first and who's second year. Um, to try and see if he's available during that time. He is teaching. Uh, directly ahead of time. 
Uh, so we just have to see, and I don't know what his Wednesday afternoons are, uh, to try and bring them present. Um, if that's something that you guys think you need. The feedback that I was getting, and I would love to, I hate, this Wilson, this Wilson left, <laughs> that's what you get for leaving. Uh, I would suggest if you guys, before, again, if he comes, he's giving up his lunch hour, running from teaching to coming in the afternoon, and if he comes, I need to know that people are gonna ask him questions and that they're gonna utilize that time, not that he had to run over from the UDP in between patients and not have lunch. So if you guys think that having an OMM person there during the reviews would be useful and that you can't get that information from the Strengths and Opportunities Report, then I will certainly bring that to Dr. Bailey. Um, but I would ask that you talk as a class um, because I do, I respect your time, I respect my time, I respect faculty time. So I don't want people giving up their lunch hour. It sounds like a small thing, but like I said, He's also the residency director for the rotating internship. He's also a preceptor in OMM. He, has, he teaches in other classes. He teaches in brain and behavior. He has a lot of other commitments. So it sounds small, um, but every three weeks, that adds up. Um, and then on Wednesdays, we also have journal club. They have other commitments that take up lunch hours and other meetings. So I just want to know, before I make that request, that that's something that is something that the class at large feels would be useful or helpful. So I'd ask, I'll ask Wilson to do like a little poll to, don't, don't send him 40 emails. I'll ask him to do like a little poll to see how you guys feel about that, and I'm happy to bring that back. So, all right, how are we doing? Thank you. Uh, Vinaparak, traditional first year. Um, I think uh, one of the other things that some of my classmates had brought up about OMM specifically, um, in the OMM lab, I th a lot of the techniques are taught to us there. And then we take our notes on the iPad and then practice the te techniques immediately after. And sometimes we're not able to get through all the techniques because of time constraints and things like that. Um, was there ever a discussion when planning the curriculum about having the techniques being presented during the actual lecture hour um, with the professor doing it with a simulated patient up front? Yeah, we've been doing this a long time, and we've had them done during the lecture hour. It's challenging uh, to get a good visual of that. But my question is, are you guys using the videos from Nicholas? Like, Nicholas has videos, and 90% of the students aren't looking at those at all. <laughs> and so I would just first send you to look at the Nicholas videos, um, which you have access to for free, uh, on the library website. Um, we, again, we try not to use up um, lecture time with stuff that already has resources for people to use. Um, so if you tell me that those videos aren't useful, I'm not sure how much more useful ours would be. Um, but those are a resource that most students don't use. So I would send you to those. Other questions? Hi, my name is Addis Solo Iwole. I am a fourth year medical student in the traditional program. And so this question is not really going to be as related to you guys, but in our curriculum, we are, like during your third year, your grades are based on your clerkships. And it's um, at the end of the year, you get something called an MSPE letter. And most of the class really scores around the same in terms of uh, the comats. So it's, the way the curve, I guess, is shaped, most people fall in the same category. Is there a way, or is the school gonna consider kind of like trying to parse that out? I don't understand the question. The quartiles. Most uh -huh. people fall in the third quartile of our class. So it's, most people fall, like 70% of the class on the MSPE letter fall in the third quartile. So I feel like there's four, will there ever be like five? I would have to def refer to, defer to Dr. Boyd because just okay. based on quartiles, it's who's the top 25%, who's the second 25%, okay. who's the third 25%, and then quintiles, who's the top 20, second 20, third. So it's not possible for 70% to be in that, the way that you're describing it. Okay, what I'm saying, I think it, it just seems like it's not really as differentiated because most people fall, it seems, in the same area. I would defer to Dr. Boyd and okay. I can ask her, but I don't think mathematically it's what you're thinking. Okay. Um, so there. Okay. Um, your, um, thank you. 
Your MSP E letters are your basically your dean's letters that go out to residencies. It's a national standard. The format is, is standardized across osteopathic and allopathic schools. Um, it is designed really not to focus on grades. They have your transcript. They'd like to get a general sense of your ranking so that they know what to do within your one school, like how you did. Um, but really the bulk of MSPE is what else? Did you do research? Did you publish? Were you doing mission trips or outreach? You know, what else? Um, and so with regards to the MSPEs, we always tell you, how you do in your classes is the best predictor of how you're gonna do on boards. And boards is way more heavily weighted than it was ever intended to be, but it is the first cutoff, the first thing that cuts people in terms of programs looking at you for various specialties. Once you get over that hump and you're like, yay, 650, 700, that was great, I'm going for ortho, and you get that interview, everybody in that room has those board scores. What else? And some students are like, that's all I got. <laughs> so we encourage you to make sure that you have something else. The board scores are a big deal, and trust me, our exam writing, everything that we're doing is directed to make you as prepared for that as possible and to let you know. So that's why we say, don't screw around. When we tell you 82 to 85, if you're not there, you're not there. <laughs> and this is going to predict how you're going to do on boards. So take it seriously and don't screw around going, I'll figure it out. Meanwhile, you're not learning that content as you go and you're accumulating more information and bad study habits and you get to boards and you're just learning the information truly for the first time or maybe not at all. And then you get what you get on boards. But that being said, after you get that, past that first cut, everybody has those rocking board scores. What else? <laughs> Find something that you're passionate about, find something that's related to the field that you're interested in going into, and so some longitudinal commitment to an organization or to research or to something. So we have something else to put on your MSPEs because honestly, that's the biggest part of the MSPEs. That's what residencies are looking for if they look at the MSPEs. They're looking for the what else. They already looked at your Comlex scores, meh, okay, you're in, you're out, whatever. It's Comlex scores, it's board scores, and then depending on the residency, it's research or service, depending on the specialty. That's what they're looking at. Other questions? I really appreciate all your time. Uh, please continue to use your curriculum reps. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here. Have a great day.